Dear Father, Almighty God, we come into your presence this morning to uplift your name, to worship and praise you as our Almighty Father, loving God. We invite your Holy Spirit to be with us now as we worship you, as we fellowship and as we listen to your word. May we be blessed and may we be spiritually uplifted through this service. In Jesus' name, Amen. I love that, seeing yourself in his presence. Know this, God is God. He made us and we can make him. We're his people, his wealth and his sheep. And with a password of thank you, make yourselves at home, talking about praise. Thank him, worship him. For God is sheer beauty, all generous in love, loyal always and ever. It's not funny, it's boring, it was bored, and 
we ate the food and the food was kind of okay but he was bored with the food. And then after lunch he couldn't get comfortable, he sat on the couch, then he sat on another seat, then he rolled around on the carpet and he was still bored, bored, bored. And he went and saw what his two brothers were doing, but that was boring. So he went out into the garden and the garden was beautiful, you could see that it had a lovely lawn, it had beds, flower beds and roses and trees. But guess what Jimmy thought of the garden? It was boring. There was no bouncy castles, there was no trampolines, there was no slides, there was no football to kick. So Jimmy was just bored. So he came back inside again, he asked his mum for a book, and he turned the pages of the book, but the, he just couldn't be bothered with the book that day. The book was boring, so he put the book down, and then he wandered out into the where the stairs were and there were some pictures up and there were pictures of people for a while he looked at the pictures of people but he thought, no I've seen pictures of people before, they're boring so he sat on the stairs and the stairs were very much like these stairs and for a while he sat there with his hands on his, on his uh, fists and he wondered what to do then he looked at those stairs and he saw that there was a gap can you see the gap between each of the stairs? And so Jimmy thought, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to see if my head fits between the two stairs, two steps. So he started to squeeze his head between two of the steps. And this wasn't boring anymore. This was like he was on an exploration trip. He was checking things out. He was going into a cave. This was really exciting for Jimmy. He wasn't bored anymore. But then after a while, he thought, well, this actually is a little bit boring now, so he starts to try it and come back out from the steps. But he couldn't come back out. He tried twisting his head this way and pulling, but that didn't work. He twisted his head that way, but that didn't work, and he just he couldn't get out. For a while he just lay there wondering, what am I going to do? And then he cried for help. And he cried for help, and the first two people that came were his brothers. And what do you think his brothers did when they saw Jimmy there, lying back between the steps? What do you think he did, they did? They laughed! They thought it was hilarious! But then, after a little while, they could see that actually Jimmy wasn't very happy. Jimmy's face had started to go red. Jimmy had red hair, and his face was nearly as red as his red hair. Uh, and his brother saw we need to help our brother. So one, each one of them grabbed one of Jimmy's legs and they started to pull, they started to heave Jimmy like they were in a tug of war, if you in a tug of war. They heaved Jimmy as hard as they could. But Jimmy didn't budge and if anything, his face went redder than his red hair. After a while he cried out for more help and his brothers went and got mum. And mum came and mum saw how Jimmy was stuck between the two steps. And mum think about kitchens a lot, it's very sexist for me to say that, but that's what this mum did. And she went into the kitchen, uh, I think she may have got butter, but she was very healthy living mum, so I think she may have got olive oil, and she put olive oil behind <laughs> Jimmy's ears, because the intention was to pull Jimmy out and slide out because of the oil. Did that work? No, nothing that anybody was trying was getting Jimmy out of this situation. And then he comes along to that. And Dad walks in, Dad, you know, sometimes Dad's fold their arms. Dad's folding his arms and he walks around the steps, the stairs, because you could do it like you can with that one. And he looks at Jimmy, he looks at everybody else, shakes his head, and then stands in front of Jimmy. And he says, give me your hand, Jimmy. And Jimmy gives him his hand. He says, give me your other hand, Jimmy. And Jimmy gives his other hand. And he pulls Jimmy out forwards. Forwards. So Jimmy came out. Save us in life when no one else can. I can. 
Jesus. Yeah. Now I want you to remember next time you feel like you're stuck and you're in trouble, think of Jimmy stuck in the stairs. And think, I too can turn to someone like Dad, I can turn to someone like Jesus to help me. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, I thank you that you sent your Son to save us. And I pray that each of us here will turn to you constantly through our lives, that we also may be saved. In your name. Amen. Right, I need six volunteers to be out in the box. Verse 6. Whilst at the same time 
remaining as much asleep as possible. And so as you continue your journey downstairs, eyes mostly closed, feelings for door frames, for edges of steps and stairs, for changes in texture between carpet and floor, until eventually you find yourself at the entrance to the kitchen. And once there, you stride confidently to your left, because on the left-hand side of the kitchen is where the work surface dips down to accommodate a sink. And having located said sink, you reach equally as confidently up to your left, with a familiarity that has not bred contempt, but a warm glow in your heart. For in this cupboard is contained every drinking utensil in the house. Every cup, mug, glass and beaker lined up like they're going into battle. But the information that comes back to your sleep-addled brain is not the expected one to do with cylindrical devices, but much flatter utensils. At first, you are bemused and confused. You reckon you've done pretty well up until this uh, stage. You're maybe only 28, 29% awake. But now, of course, your cognitive functions are having to kick in as you're having to persuade yourself that you are at home, which indeed you are. And you come to the conclusion that this cupboard no longer contains drinking utensils, but plates, side plates, dinner plates, plates whose names are only known to the most refined amongst us, but plates. You decide you have four options. Option number one is simply to turn on the light and go searching. But you know, as soon as you turn on that light, you will be 100% awake in an instant, doomed to spend hours looking at the ceiling, trying to return to sleep. And no one wants that. Option number two uh, commences with you trying to frantically remember those conversations you must have had where there were communications about movements in the kitchen. Communications you now realise you were probably hearing but not really listening to. For option number two involves going back upstairs and confronting your other half to demand to know where the drinking utensils are now stored. But that will not end well. For Option number three uh, demands of you, again, a, a, a liveness, a flexibility, uh, but even at three o'clock in the afternoon would be a challenge for you. For option number three cuts out the middle man and asks you to contort your body to drink directly from the tap. But this option's fraught with danger, fraught with danger, for the slightest misalignment that you would have a face full of the coldest of cold 3am water. And if it were possible, you would be more than 100% awake in an instant. 150 at least. And nobody wants that. And so it's option number four. You reach up, back to that cupboard to the left. And at 3.04am, you're standing barefoot in your kitchen Lapping water out of a plate, like your cat. <laughs> and as you return back upstairs, feeling for changes in texture between carpet and floor for door frames, uh, you ponder how, for some people, they seem to be born embracing change. Whereas others, they seem to grow to embrace change. Whilst others of us, while well, others of us, we have change thrust upon us. I wonder if the disciples in John chapter 4, the passage that Pastor Jacques asked me to look at today, I wonder if the disciples are considered, considering that they have had change thrust upon them. John's often people's favourite gospel, isn't it? It begins with that amazing, profound, deep, wondrous prologue. And I know that there are many classical musical, you know, classical music lovers in this church, and so uh, you can understand maybe better that the prologue has been described as an overture. An overture that introduces the, and hints at the themes that are going to, be, going to be developed in the symphony that is John's Gospel. The first movement arguably comes uh, when it starts at John chapter 2 verse 1 and goes through to John chapter 4 verse 46. 
from Jesus' first explicit entrance into Cana in the Gospel to his return to Cana in verse 46 of chapter 4. The clever people, theologians and scholars, those sorts, they've noticed that there are some unifying themes that run through this section of John. And in fact, the main unifying theme is newness. So what we find is that the Messiah that was introduced in such a profound way in this overture at the beginning, he now breaks through into human history in this movement of newness and change. He breaks through in this breathless, barely able to keep up way, a thrilling way. And you can only think of the disciples, we the reader, we can get to just pause and reflect for a while, but the disciples they're just there, and they're just on the ground, and they don't even know about all the change, and they're having to keep up. In chapter 2, we have the wedding at Canaan, and new wine, and all that that represents. Later on in chapter 2, we have Jesus introducing to us a new concept of the temple and the church, a temple based on his resurrected body. In chapter 3, we have the nighttime conversation with Nicodemus, and we get to understand uh, conversion in a way that nobody ever thought of before. Conversion that's based on being born again and from above of spirit and water. Later on in chapter 3, we have uh, Jesus explaining what's going on here as he himself is coming into human history that God is dealing with the sin problem, with our problem, in a new and unexpected way by sending his Son not to condemn us, but to love us and so that we might be saved. And then we get to chapter 4. And chapter 4, verse 8, is a wonderfully mundane verse. Amongst all this swirling change and these concepts and these paradigm shifts, amongst all this profundity, we get this everyday run-of-the-mill comment from John in his Gospel. The disciples have gone into town, gone into the city, to buy some food. That's all. So it's not in brackets in my Bible, and many of your Bibles have no doubts. An incidental comment. We don't get to hear of the disciples again until verse 27 of chapter 4. And by the time we get to verse 27 of chapter 4, uh, John says that it was just then, just then, just as Jesus is concluding his conversation with the woman at the well. One of the most famous conversations in the Bible, if not one of the most famous conversations before or since between a man and a woman, that conversation, just then they come in and they are astonished that Jesus is speaking with a woman. Just then. And one wonders how uh, astonished they would have been had they kept up with all the change. You see, the pace of change hasn't stopped just because they've popped into town to get some food. No, it's kept on. You wonder how they would have felt if they'd been there as Jesus introduced this new water, this new refreshing water, this water that would slate our thirst like no water has before, like no water drawn from a well or a cistern. You wonder how they would have felt if they'd been there and they understood that Jesus built on this new concept of a new temple based on his resurrected body when he introduced worship based not on geography, not on Gerizim for the Samaritans, Jerusalem for the Jews, but based on worshipping in spirit and truth. And they're still astonished. I kind of feel sorry for them, because all that they have done is they've popped into town, gone down to their version of a local supermarket for something to eat, taken a time out, and things have kept moving on. Things have kept changing. If you could have put a time signature on this movement here in John's Gospel, I think it would be Allegro, because things are just moving so quickly. It's as if you popped out into the fire when you're at church to get a bulletin, and you come back and someone's taken a seat, in fact not a seat, they've taken your seat. And you look up and the pulpit's gone or been moved or changed. They've moved the piano, they've changed the hymn book, they've changed the order of service, all without debate and consultation. It's as if you're at home and you've popped out to do a chore and you come back and someone's wearing that jumper, your favourite jumper, your holy jumper, not holy in a saintly way, the jumper that's stretched and just fits and makes you feel comfortable and warm at home. They're wearing that jumper. Not only that, they've taken your place at the table. It's as if you come down and you try and get a glass from the cupboard 
and unexpectedly finds plates. Disciples were astonished. And there's some hint of resistance there, because we don't like change, really. And some of us may be born embracing change, but actually there are parts of our lives we like to keep the same, that we can navigate with our eyes closed, because those parts of life give us a, a sense of security, so we resist change. <laughs> there's a certain irony here, an irony for us who are here today who are sat here. And that is that people that occupy buildings such as these are their land of ours, us in other words. And we're regarded as that section of the population who are amongst the most intransigent in society. We change the least, that's the narrative that gets communicated to us. And then you can see from this passage, these two or three chapters in John, that actually Christianity is all about change. That's the irony that Christians, we as a group of people, should be the most changing people in the world because that is what Christianity is all about. Transformation and change. It's quite an irony to consider. And so the disciples, they, they resist their astonishment and astonishment for Jesus followers in John's Gospels that we can know doesn't mean it's a good astonishment. For other people, for normal people, if you like, the crowds, when they are astonished or amazed, as that word is sometimes translated, they're just amazed at Jesus' deeds and his acts. But for disciples, it's not a good thing. In John chapter 3, certainly just the previous chapter, Jesus has explicitly said to Nicodemus, Do not be astonished that I say to you that you must be born again or from above. Because this sort of astonishment conveys incomprehension. They just don't get what Jesus is doing, where Jesus is coming from, where Jesus is at. So they're astonished that Jesus here is speaking with a woman. Voltaire. Voltaire said that you can judge a man by his questions. The thing about the questions in this part of John is that John doesn't put them in people's mouths. They don't come out of people's mouths. In my mind, it's almost as if he hangs them above the participants' heads, pinning them to a string above their heads. They just hang there. No one asks them. In fact, the text says no one asks these questions. And so we as readers, we maybe need to struggle a bit. We need to decide whether these are the sorts of questions they were echoing around the disciples' minds. The sort of questions that came because they were astonished, they just didn't know what was going on. Or whether these were the sorts of questions that John and his society and his community would have asked given the situation. The questions. The questions are, uh, in the original it says, what do you seek? Modern translations try and change that to help us. What do you want? They want to know what Jesus is on about here. Where, do you, where are you coming from with this? Where are you going to with this? What are you seeking to try and achieve? Why are you speaking, talking to her? The easiest way to answer this question is just to carry on with the story, right? The easiest way is to go, say, to verse 39. Very familiar story. We know that the outcome of this amazing conversation that Jesus has with the Samaritan woman is that people come to believe in him. Many Samaritans come to believe in him, we learn in verse 39. In verse 41, we learn that many more Samaritans come to believe in him. So you could just say that what Jesus is at here, he's got an evangelistic thing in mind. But our suspicion is, and uh, we we'll probably know that there's something more going on here in this movement of change, in these paradigm shifts, in these new concepts that are being thrown at us in this part of John. A number of years ago, I was sat in a church, and from my vantage point, I could see out to the front door and through to the foyer. And as I glanced in that direction, a man came in, and the man was wearing a hat. And he continued to wear this hat as he shook a few people's hands in the foyer, and still continued to wear his hat as he sat at one of the pews, in one of the pews. And I could feel myself getting tense seeing this man walk in with a hat. I was worried about what people were going to say to him. He was obviously a visitor, and I was worried how 
people were going to inform this gentleman that he shouldn't be wearing a hat and how he was going to react. Who did he walk out? Because as soon as you see a man walking into church, it's a point of conflict because we know the rules, right? The rules are that as a man, you do not wear a hat in church. And it might go back to 1 Corinthians 11 where Paul says to his parishioners, uh, men don't cover your heads. But of course, Paul's not possibly thinking about our context. They didn't have church buildings for another couple of hundred years. It might go back to the Middle Ages in our culture, in British culture, where in the Middle Ages it came to be that you took off your hat and doffed your hat to someone that was superior to you in some way. Later on, that developed so much that men always used to take their hat off when they came indoors. The thinking goes, doesn't it, if there's anyone that you should show respect to and take your hat off for, it's God. Because that's the rule. And okay, there are other rules that you need to try and to take into consideration because certain clergymen and certain denominations, they can wear hats. And uh, military people in certain situations in churches, they can wear hats. Jews in their worship space, they wear caps. There are, there are all those rules around it, but basically, we are brought up as males from birth, no baby bonnet for baby boys. You do not wear hats in church. That's the rule. And as I watched this man, as he wore this hat, I was waiting for that moment where there would be a release of tension, where he would take the hat off, that point of conflict would disappear, but it never came. And as I reflected on this, it was almost as if the man was standing before me, and the man that was wearing the hat started to fade into the background. He started to disappear, and all that was there was just a hat floating there. And what a hat it was. If you want to wear a hat to get under Adventist skins, uh, and I'm not suggesting you should do that, but you would wear this hat, because this hat, I came to understand, was a pork pie hat. Not only was it being inappropriately worn, it was unclean. But that's the thing about rules and regulations and custom and practice. Once you start to focus on those things and start to lose the people context in which they arose, well, the people start to disappear. The disciples were astonished that Jesus was speaking with a woman. Astonished. Well, one wonders how astonished they would have been if they realised that Jesus was not just speaking with a woman, he was asking her for a drink, wasn't he? Something that Jews were not supposed to do after favours of Samaritans. He wasn't just speaking with a woman, in fact he was speaking with her, not just to her, he was speaking with her, he was discussing theology and deep things, and you weren't supposed to do that. Rabbi Ben Eliezer later on would say in answer to the question, should Jews teach their daughters the Torah, the law, the first five books? He said, no. That's as bad as teaching them literally. You shouldn't be doing that. One wonders how astonished the disciples would have been if they knew that Jesus wasn't just speaking with a woman, he was speaking with a woman of ill repute. You've had five husbands, and the one you have now only isn't your husband. They're just astonished that Jesus is speaking with a woman. You would have hoped that they would have put just a, a small word in there to make it a little bit more humane, if you like, just a definite article or another preposition that Jesus was speaking with the woman because at least her individuality would have started to come back. But it was just a woman, it didn't matter, it wasn't this woman, it was, it was just any woman that mattered to the disciples. It wasn't her individuality, who she was, they didn't even know her name, it was just her womanness that was of concern to her. And they were astonished that Jesus was speaking with her. I imagine that you're experts on compassion in this church by now, with your Compassion Week and this series of sermons that is picking out moments of compassion in Jesus and the Jesus story. Psychologists say that once you start to um, do that sort of thing where you take the rules, the customs and the practices and you prioritise them over the people, uh, the context that the people bring to those, you start to lose that person and you start to go down a very, very rocky road indeed. You dehumanise them. You lose their sense of individuality and once you dehumanise someone, you start to stigmatise them and then compassion actually becomes impossible, becomes impossible. 
Martha Nussbaum, the gospel Christian, sorry, Christian writer and philosopher, she says this about it. She says, compassion demands a certain flexibility, a freedom from presuppositions and rules, so that it can be governed by the needs of the victim and respond accordingly. In a Christian sense, compassion has an inner compulsion that presses one to go beyond the realms of ethical duty and cultural convention. Jesus famously in this passage is challenging us, challenging us in terms of our traditions and rules and customs and practices that only, it seems, with the passage of time have gained a sense of authority that means they come over people rather than as something that is about people. He's giving us a new conceptual framework or reminding us of what that conceptual framework should be and how, the, how we should deal with each other, how we should deal with people. And Jesus does that all the time. He, he's trying to make sure we get this context right. So uh, man is not made for, sab for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath is made for man. The, the Ten Commandments are not something that stand on their own. He brilliantly combines Leviticus and Deuteronomy to let us know that we are, it's all about loving God and loving our fellow man. The problem is, when you start to see people and you start to get this sort of thing out of context, you no longer see a child of God. You see a divorcee, you see a bad mother or an absent father. You no longer see someone that's created in the image of God, no matter how flawed it is by the entrance of evil into the world. You just see a black person or a white person. You no longer see uh, someone with potential like God sees us, with the potential for change and renewal. We just see people who we label as immigrants, illegal or otherwise. As terrorists, dare I say that, to this day and age. It's refugees. And what's, uh, what we're getting to here is not something that is about some sort of anarchic society. What we're getting to here is not political correctness gone mad. What we're getting to here is to try and see each other in the way that God sees each other, I believe. To try and see us uh, and try and treat us how God treats us, with a compassion that's infused with grace. Grace that means that we're treated like we need to be treated, not like we deserve to be treated, especially not like we deserve to be treated based on laws and customs and practices where the people have suddenly been diminished. I imagine, imagine the spiritual community. I wonder whether John doesn't put those questions into anyone in particular into their mouths because it's the disciples as a community. It might even be just the community they represent because this is not just an individual thing, it's a community thing. And I was wondering, just imagine, just imagine being part of a spiritual community where grace-infused compassion is just the norm. Imagine that. Where individuals are at the same time able to be part of that community, uh, but also maintain their individuality. Where the community itself is part of that body of Christ, that new temple that Jesus spoke of. A body that is making its own contribution towards that restoration of the image of God in each of us. Imagine that. John Fawcett wrote our final hymn. It's often a hymn that's sung at funerals. But actually it's a hymn that celebrates the beauty, the joy, it stalls what the benefits are of Christian community. And he writes of hopes, fears, burdens and woes that we all have, those things we all have and that we all experience. But one would hope within a spiritual community, a Christian community, one that's infused with Christian compassion, that our individuality won't be taken away from us because of those things, our identity won't be taken away, but we will, be, we will share those burdens and overcome them together. Imagine such a community where we can grow to be the individuals who God wants us to be, part of a community of transformation and change. Imagine that. Imagine that as we sing our final kingdom together.
Our kind and our loving Heavenly Father, I thank you that you sent your Son to save us, to redeem us, to transform and to change us. And I pray that each person here, each one of us, can drink of that water, of that wine, of the bread you later talk about, that we can be part of a Christian community where compassion rules, where people are kept in context, where the rules are kept in context because of people. I pray this in your name.
spring. And dear God, we come in front of you today to say thank you, Lord, for this year and thank you for, to, for today, which we have right now. Dear God, I want to pray for everybody here right now. Fill us all with the Holy Spirit. Touch our hearts, dear God. And give us faith that we sometimes lack. I dear want to, God, I want to pray for everybody here. Everybody, those who believe in you, I pray that you strengthen their faith. But the those who are struggling with you at the moment, doubt in the total your existence, I pray, dear God, that you, just, you give them a strength and determination not to give up until they're very sure, dear God, about your existence. I pray, dear God, that you fill our lives with the Holy Spirit and take us forward. And we know one thing for sure, and that is that 2016 belongs to you. And because it belongs to you, it will belong to us, dear God. I pray for everybody who is sick today in this congregation, who is suffering with something in their life. I pray that you place the hand of healing upon them today, and that you heal them in the name of Jesus, who is my Lord, who is our Lord and Savior, dear God. We pray that your will be done in their lives, but dear God, we know what you can do. And we pray, dear God, for forgiveness of our sins. And we pray for a second coming, that you come soon and take us home. Take us to a place where there is no more tears and no more goodbyes. There is no more death. And dear God, we look forward for that day. We pray this in your beautiful name. Amen. Amen.